Hola, welcome to our today's seminar. It's a great pleasure introducing our today's seminar speaker, Tony Juarez. Tony Juarez is here from the UIB and the Mathematics Department. And the idea behind uh, the seminars, so we plan also to have more of this kind, is that we would also like to get to know what surrounds the Institute and the Physics Department here in, uh, in Palma and to learn about interesting research being done also in, in other departments, in the department, in the departments around us. <laughs> so Tony is making the start uh, today. It's a pleasure having you here. Uh, Tony is the Department for Mathematics, or Applied Mathematics, and he's a professor of Doctor since 2011. Uh, he got his degree already here from the UIB in 2001, and his PhD as well in 2006. So his research focuses on digital image processing, image analysis, mathematical computer vision, restoring vision images, stereo vision, and medical vision. So Tony had some uh, toured the world a bit. So during his PhD, he spent in total something like 60 months in different mathematical research centers around Paris. And after his PhD, he had uh, a few research days at UCLA in the US. Um, just illustrating. Uh, how important his contributions are. His two most cited papers, which are on image denoising, uh, have each of them been cited more than 2,500 times. Uh, very impressive. And last year he got uh, the prestigious Longer Higgins Prize uh, by the IEEE Computer Society for fundamental contributions in computer vision. Tony, we're very happy to have you here. Maybe if I switch off all the lights. Okay. So thanks, Ingo. And thank you, everyone, for attending this conference. Thank you for coming. It's hard to give uh, a talk just after lunch. <laughs> so, I suppose it's even harder to attend to it if you're falling asleep. So. Don't worry, if you some moment you fall asleep, I, will, I won't mind. So the, the title of the presentation is Image and Video Noise Removal. I don't think I have time to talk about video, so I will talk only about images. I have plenty of advice if someone is interested at the end. But I don't think I have time. I prefer to go slowly on all the slides. So. I work in mathematics, in mathematics applied to image processing, computer vision, etc. <coughs> but this talk is most, mostly related to image processing and not computer vision. So I like to look for, for stuff in Google Image because when you want to find something, sometimes it's much faster to work. I find it in Google Image, I find it in Dr. Web or, or whatever. So if you look for image processing, one of the main images, one of the initial images you get is this one, which is known as Lena. And this maybe someone has seen them, has seen this image. Is the test image that has been used for 40 years. Something about 40 years. And it's still being used, but in fact it doesn't give us much information. If you look just at this image about image processing. But it gives us one information. Not, know, not everybody knows the story about this image. In fact, this image was scanned from a Playboy in 1973. So we play only with this small part of the image. I put some white in the rest of the image, but if you look at the internet, you'll find it without problem. So at least it tells us that about 40 years ago, most people working in engineering and image processing were men, and still is men, just in <laughs> physics, just looking at the people in this, in this room. So then if you look for noise in Google Image Search, you will find these images. And it gives us 
a good uh, definition of what noise is, is disturbing. Somehow oscillates, it randomly oscillates, so the noise is not the sinus, which is here, it's just the oscillation over the sign, over the sign signal, and it has no structure. So these are the, the main uh, the main characteristics of noise, it has no structure, it's starting and oscillates. I mean, noise is inherent to all type of measures, so I suppose you know much more physics, uh, the physics is much more than I do on mathematics about noise. So I will concentrate, I will concentrate in, uh, in noisy images, which is what I'm working with. So <coughs> the main example of images is photography. And this is a photograph, but it's a photograph, of photograph how it's, it's acquired by our camera. If you have a reflex camera, you can output from your camera the final color image and the, what is called a raw image. I know you're familiarized with reflex of your use. So a raw image is this one. This is not from a, from a camera, it's from a mobile phone. So it's, it's the same with reflex cameras, but this one is from a, from a mobile phone. And what happens with the raw image is that first, it's really dark. We, we, really, we see really nothing. And second, it's quite strange because the color, I mean, if you get closer, you see some red and green points, etc. Because in fact, the the image acquired by the sensor in a camera or in a mobile phone is not a photograph. It's that. What is called a CVA. What our camera is recording is this pattern. Out of four pixels, there are two green values, one red value, and one blue value. So our camera is not recording the color image. In front of the CCD, it has filters and has two green filters, one red and one blue. So the, what is recorded in the raw, what, what, you out, what you take from your camera in a raw format is this. If you want to have a color image, there's plenty of stuff which is done inside the camera. The most important one is called the mosaicing, which tries to interpolate these values which are missing in here. So somehow the, the camera uses RM that fills the green, fills the red, and fills the blue missing values, then combine it again, and you have a color image. So that's why the, that's why this image is strange. And also it's dark because at the, I mean, a color image usually has eight bits per pixel and color, so the, the value goes between zero and 255 per pixel. In a raw format, we have up to 15 bits for each pizza. So it, gives, it goes between 0 and 30 seats or 35,000. So even if you see, you don't see details in here, it's because I'm putting them, displaying the image in 8 bits, but actually there's a lot of information in here that we do not see because of the difference of depth between the visualization and the raw format. And here there's a lot, a lot of noise, but as the image is hard, it's, it's dark, we don't see it. When we apply, I mean, uh, the noise at the sensor is signal dependent. I mean, it's a photon counting process, so it follows somehow a Poisson uh, variable. So the amplitude of the noise depends on the actual value of the signal, but it has no structure. If it has no structure, it's called white. White noise means that it has no structure. So is a noise that will be not very difficult to remove, but if we only have the output of the camera, the final color image, we have this. I mean, when we apply the several transformation of the camera, which is the mosaic in uh, camera correction, color corrections, whatever, you pass from here to here, <coughs> and this RE noise this is the noise you will have if you take your, now your mobile phone and you take photography here. You have <coughs> that. If you zoom in your computer and you look into the photograph, you have this, which is much harder to remove than this. And here, in fact, we have no model for this, because the model of that noise depends on the imaging chain that we don't know, on the demosaicing uh, algorithm, in the gamma correction, etc. And also the images 
that are output by the mobile phone or by the, by the camera are in JPEG format, which is a compression algorithm, which basically, uh, okay, basically takes the DCT, a uh, cosine transform of your image, and removes the small coefficients. So it's like taking a Fourier transform and putting to zero all the small coefficients. So this modifies totally also the, the noise. So we have no model at the, at the last step. So if you have no model, that means it's going to be much more complicated to, to remove the noise. Another classical example is uh, medical imaging MRI. So you have a lot of noise in the MRI images. The, the model is different. It's not like in photography that you have a Poisson variable. Here you have a rice variable. Uh, you know, anyway, there are, there are probability distributions, which is BH, which is BH, which means that the expected value of this variable is not the value that we want. So this is important. And it's not in, it's, it's inhomogeneous, meaning that depending on where you are placed in the image, the signal changes, the, the noise changes, the amplitude of the noise changes. So it doesn't change not only on the on the signal, but also in the position, so it'll be more complicated to, to remove. And also, for example, this is a, this is what, what you have in a, in an animated movie when you go to the cinema and you have the movies of your kids. And in these movies, in fact, what they do is they build the 3D scenario. So they actually have this in the computer. They know that these are a leaf. They have a model of the test in this leaf. They have a really complete description of this scene. But at a certain moment, they have to generate the image from a certain point of view with a certain lighting conditions. Uh, how do they do that? They have to compute for each pixel a huge integer. And they approximate by a sum. And, uh, Depending on the number of terms of this sum, then we, this will converge to the, or to, the, to the real image or not. And in fact, to render a high resolution, high quality image can take a few hours, four or five hours to generate one single image. If you have to generate a film of 90 minutes and you have uh, 25 frames per second, it's a lot of time. So, if we look carefully to those details, this is what you, what you have. Here there's no noise, because in fact, if you have enough time, if you have years and years to generate this image, it will be perfect. So it's not that there's a noise. The noise, in fact, is that our algorithm has no converse. But somehow it seems like, uh, like an additive noise, like, like a photography noise. But it's not, it's not the case. I had some movies, but anyway, so I don't think I have enough time to talk about movies. I will skip, uh, I will skip that. So what we've seen is that uh, there's not a single model for noise. In much cases, there's no model for noise. And it's different in any application. But still, we still work in the additive white noise model, which is the classical one. And why do we do that? Because in order to solve all the problems I presented, and many more, you always reduce it to a problem where the noise is white, which means that the noise has no structure, and is uniform. I mean, the amplitude of the noise is uniform, which means that it doesn't depend on the signal. And in fact, this model was not in any of the previous slides, but in all examples, we reduce to this. Applying different strategies like multiscale strategies, variance stabilization, etc., etc. In all cases, we reduce the, the model to this one, which is the classical one, and for which there's a huge, huge literature. So I will, in three slides, point out the three main uh, topics I think is, are interesting. Um, how do we reduce noise? Taking like average. If you have n variables which are RID, it means that they are independent and have the same distribution. When you take an average, the variance, which is uncertainty on our variable, is reduced by n. 
So if we want to reduce noise, we just have to take averages. And if we are able to ensure that our variables are IID, we're going to remove the noise. So for example, if you take uh, n pixels, you take n noisy values, and you make the average, what's going, I mean, following the model, following the additive model we have in here, if we take the average, and we make the difference with the original value, you have to put an expectation, because we are going, we are working with random variables. So we are going to have the noise, which is reduced by n. And then we have the original value, the true value that we do not know and we do not have, minus the average of the non-noisy value of the pixels we chose. So if we are able to find the correct pixels, just taking an average, this is going to give the correct value. So the problem should be how to find the correct pixels because we do not have access to these values. We have access to the noisy values. So that's, that's the main problem in the noisy. Well, oh. The noise is a, has a, a zero average or not? Yeah. The noise and white noise, yes. Yes, yeah. Okay, I see. The, the problem of the, in this case, no. In this case, the problem is that the, has no zero average, but in this case here, so, okay. yeah. If not, we would have a VH plus a 10 here if it's not zero mean. Mm -hmm. So the problem is just finding the correct, the correct values, the correct pixels. How do you do that? If you have an image, you might say that the pixels that are close belong to the same object, which are especially close belong to the same object. And if they have a similar color in the noisy image, so if the noisy values are quite similar, then the original values were also quite similar. So you just take an average, you put an integrator or a sum, doesn't matter, of the closed pixels, meaning that for each pixel, you average the closed pixels. And you put the weight, which is decreasing, on the difference of the color values. Meaning that if the pixel was clo is close to my reference pixel, I will put a large weight. If it's, uh, the distance is too large, in fact, this is going to be zero because the exponential decays very fast. So somehow you put weights depending on this distance. And we remove noise, and it works not bad, but uh, the Peirce formula does not apply. I mean, this is working. But as you choose your pixels comparing the noisy value, the pixels we choose are not independent. I mean, as you choose those values already, regarded, already looking at its value, the choice we do is not independent of the noise. So the formula we had before, this one, that has this sigma square over n, it's not true. It's going to remove the noise, but the formula does not apply because the choice we do depends on the noise. So we are not actually choosing I, I D values. So this is the first method. The second thing we find in the literature is variational stuff, meaning that if you have any inverse problem where you know how, your, how the process is, what you do is to write it with two integrals. One, and somehow you apply this model. As we had our model, is just an addition. We have a difference. And we regularize it. We put a regularizer. I mean, all inverse problems are the same. We have a, a fidelity term, which asks our, uh, I mean, our function depends on u. We ask our image u solution to be similar to our v and to be regular, and then we ask, in fact, this lambda, we choose it somehow that the energy we remove for our image is quite similar to sigma squared. So it just, it's a typical way of writing inverse problems. You put an integral on the fidelity and an integral of the regularization. What happens is that the typical regularization is, a, is an integral of the gradient, a squared or non-squared. This is not a good model for images, because in fact, images have a lot of texture, so they have a lot of oscillations, which are non-noise. So if you minimize an integral which contains the gradient, 
you have something which is very smooth, something which is uh, <coughs> uh, nearly piecewise linear or piecewise constant, which is not the case in real images. So this basically removes the texture. And this is due to the method how minimize that. That's not important. But the important thing is that you remove the tester and you even import your solution to be regular. And the third idea in the literature is I've written wavelets, I've written DCT, but generally if you have a transform, if you have an orthogonal transform of your data, uh, you cannot always transform your data and cancel some coefficients or modify some coefficients. So what you do is, for example, if we have a Fourier transform, you are suppose you are more familiar with Fourier transform than with wavelets. If you apply a Fourier transform, what happens is that depending on the regularity of your signal, the information of your function will be concentrated in a few coefficients. While the small oscillations will be near zero. We have will be concentrated in coefficients which are near zero. So if you can sell the small coefficients, you will cancel the small uh, oscillations, and keeping the large coefficients, you will keep the main information of your, of your function. The problem is that with a Fourier transform, that's not true, because if your function is not differentiable or is not continuous, then you have huge number of coefficients which are large, which are not zero. So you cannot do that with a Fourier transform, or you cannot do that with a DCT. So what you do, when you have a Fourier transform of a discrete cosine transform, you do it with the small patches A by A. So you, you apply this transform, and you can sell coefficients, but only with A by A patches, which in fact is exactly the same thing which is done when you compress your image in JPEG. When you have an image in PNG or BMP or, or TIFF, and you convert it to JPEG, you are doing exactly that. You are taking the small patches A by A, you are doing the DCT, you are cancelling the small coefficients, and you are keeping only the coefficients which are not here. So it's the same thing we can do with, with in order to, to remove noise, because when you compress an image, you remove oscillation. So exactly the same. I've written in wavelets because uh, it's more recent, and uh, they were fancy some years ago. Uh, what you do is just, you have a basis, you take your, your function, and you write the decomposition of your function, but you only keep the coefficients with a magnitude larger than a certain value. And what happens in wavelets is that they are concentrated in space and in scale. So if you have a discontinuity on your senior, it only affects some, some coefficients and not all the coefficients, which is not the case with the Fourier basis. So the problem is that even if a DCT with small patches or, or a wavelet is, is able to, to describe correctly the image, you still have Gibbs phenomenon as you have with the Fourier transform. And uh, when you decide to cancel a coefficient and not another one, you have some experience with wavelets. There, what kind of wavelets you use? Uh, usually they use simlets. I'm not using this for the noise. It's classical stuff and you use simlets. This is the double sheets wavelength. That's if you have a noisy image, that's what you have with the wavelet thresholding. You see some artifacts here, which are wavelets which were not cancelled, while the neighboring wavelets were cancelled. So you see some kind of in fact you see the shape of, of the, the wave of the <coughs> of the model wavelet. This is the total variation. This is the variational stuff. And this is the simple average. So finally, uh, I would say this is working a bit better than the other ones, meaning that as simple as possible is not always better, but sometimes better to keep it simple. So <clears throat> the fourth idea I'm going to talk about, it takes from, from pixels to patches, and says that if we look at this image, and for example, you are in the sky, we can find several patches, meaning squares of, let's say, 8 by 8, or 5 by 5, or 7 by 7, that are quite similar. 
If we look, for example, in here, all the greater squares, which are in, <coughs> in this part also quite similar, the same in the green, but in fact, you can find similar pictures even if they are far away. Like in here, or with several repetitive structures, or in tester. So we can try for each one of these groups to learn. I mean, we could try to learn a model, but with the average value of that model, it's enough. So in fact, we do not have to learn. We do not need to learn a model. We just need to take an average. Because we are not interested in describing a model of the sky. We are just interested in knowing the correct value of that pizza. So I don't have to learn a, a digestion model or whatever. I'll do it later. So this algorithm is really simple. It takes still an average, so it's not different from the, from the other average. But instead of comparing the pixel, it compares a patch. So if we do not look at this part, we still have a weighted average. So we are choosing pixels, and we are averaging the pixels. But the weight, with this strange formula, it basically says that the weight will depend on the distance of this patch with this patch, or this patch with this patch, or this patch with this patch. In fact, as I draw this figure, the actual value of pixel p is exactly the same value of this one. And I mean, the four, the four pixels have exactly the same value, even if the blocks around the patches around are quite different. So this just says, instead of looking at the value of the pixel, I will look to a whole neighborhood around it. And if I do that, I will have something which is more robust. So that, that's exactly what we do. We just do an average. But you know, in order to put these weights, we compute the distance of patches. The Gaussian is, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a way a bit complicated to write the difference of patches, putting it in a certain decay on the boundary of the, of the patch, but this is not important. Mainly, you do, a, you do an average, and you weight it by the distance of, of squares. That changes many things. That changes first that you can go far to look at it, because you are more able to discriminate the correct values of the incorrect values. So can you, go, you can go here, and you can go here, and still you are able to discriminate the correct values. And somehow, you are doing some hypothesis, which is Markovian, because you suppose that two patches that are similar will have also the same value in the center. Because finally, you are only interested in the, of the value of the center, and you are only averaging the value of the center. So when you're doing this, you're supposing that once you've seen the neighborhood, you can guess which is the value of the center. Just the same that thinking that the same stuff as saying that this is my problem hypothesis. So uh, I mean, this is like computing the distance of two patches as y is the center of the patch, and x is the center of the patch here, t is just moving around this and this. So it's, it's, it's just like saying, I make the difference of this one with this one, this one with this one, this one with this one, and I make the sum. But as you have the, you have the Gaussian here, means that when you make this distance, the weight you give to the central pixel is larger than the weight you give to pixels that are farther from the center. But it just, it's a weighted distance of these two patches. What's interesting about that is that if you plot those weight distributions, you have this. Here I'm plotting, I'm fixing the, the pixel in the center in each one of these images, which is, I suppose is this one, and here's this one. And for this pixel, for the pixel in the center, I'm displaying the distribution probability. So white, it means it's a large value, and black means a zero value. So somehow, when you do this, your ways are adapting to your function, to your image, to the geometry, to the geometry of, of your image. So here you have a line. Here you have a contour, which is curved. Here it sees, it finds that, in fact, this is repeated here. And here it sees that this is a, 
a periodic pattern or a periodic pattern. So when you denote, you just average these values here. Here you will average these ones. So somehow uh, it finds the correct information, and you see a lot of black because as, as the as the waves are given by a Gaussian, the Gaussian goes to zero very fast. So oh, in all this point the distance, it's already large or large enough to the Gaussian to put those values to zero. Uh, I have just one example. This is the noisy. This is the variational. This is the wavelength thresholding or the typhoon thresholding. This is the neighborhood filter. And this is the result of, of the algorithm. So it's, it, it improves. And it's easy to see that it improves the, the rest of the methods. And it's able to give something which is free of artifacts. We don't see any artifacts here. For example, here we, here we see wavelets. Here we see that color has been mixed, etc. And here we have a good solution. So it was the first algorithm having a solution of artifacts and very simple. So this was in 2005 for the tenor final seeds. We have improved a little bit. And we see the the results. Our method is, is somehow doing two, two things. <coughs> it's finding the correct patches and it's averaging them. It's not exactly finding the correct patches because you are waiting all. <coughs> but in fact, the fact that most part of weights are zero, somehow is like saying, I'm going to choose the correct patches. And from these patches, I'm going to learn. I'm going to guess the correct value. And in order to guess that value, you perform a weighted average. So if we want to improve, you can improve the selection of the correct patches. What happens is that. If our image has a noise of a standard deviation 40 or 30 or whatever, it's not easy to select the correct patches, but we could try to improve and have something more reliable. Or we can do something more complicated instead of taking an average, and that's what, what I'm going to show. We are going to complicate a little how we take this statistical estimation. So instead of an average, we are going to do something a bit more complicated, which is PCA. PCA is principal component analysis. Are you familiar with principal component analysis? I suppose most part of you. No. I mean, it's the basic tool today for that analysis. The first one. What it does is simply uh, uh, you have data in some dimension R n, for example. But in fact, you know that your data can be represented in, in much less dimension than these ones. Because you know that somehow your data, you have some value which are correlated or have a large covariance. And, and you know that somehow it lives, your data lives in a, in a less dimensional space. So you look for the change of basis. You look for another basis, for another way of representing your data in new components. And you want that, in fact, now the first component keeps the most part of the information of your data. How is done in mathematics? You ask that when you transform the data to this new basis, which is a, is a linear change of basis, uh, the components, the, the new coefficients, the first component are the most elongated possible. And then you look at the second the second vector of your basis is the, the coefficients are also really elongated in this direction. So you order by elongation of your coefficients, by the variance of the coefficients in this new basis. It's like if you have points, and you take the linear regression, and you take a line, and you just project the point into the line. For example, in one in, from going from two dimensions to one, just taking the linear regression and projecting the point onto the line, for example. If you are in larger, you have more dimensions, it changes. But this is the main tool. These and the k-means are the main tools today in, the, in that analysis, but this is really old. 
what you do is try this time to learn a model for your set of patches, or even not to learn a model to take a representation where all the information is contained in a few coefficients. So we are getting back to the to the wavelengths and to the DCT. What you are doing is you are estimating a DCT basis or a wavelet basis for each pixel of your image. So for each pixel of your image, you look for the for the patches which are nearest to the k nearest neighbor patches, meaning that you choose the patches which are similar in in which have the smallest Euclidean distance, and then you learn a basis adapted to those patches. You do it here. So when you compute the PCA, the basis you obtain is orthogonal and this in fact is orthogonal. So based the, um, <coughs> the vectors are orthogonal, meaning that the data is isn't correlated. So you can use all the stuff that's done with stuff from the shoulder wavelets, etc. So you just threshold the coefficients. You have you have your new basis for your reference patch which contains the reference pixel. You have a certain local position as we as we got with the wavelets. And then you threshold these coefficients. The difference is that instead of thresholding these coefficients depending on its magnitude, in fact, you use the, the principal values which uh, somehow say the amount of information in the new basis or the first element of the basis, the second, the third, etc. So if you threshold looking at the values or at the principal values, it just, uh, it's more robust to noise. I had somewhere, and it was better, that if you can sell depending only on this money. In fact, the, the principal components are just the vectors of the covariance matrix. You have your data, you compute the covariance matrix, and then you compute the eigenvectors and the values, and this is the PCA. So, so somehow, for each pixel, you learn or you compute an adapter representation and you threshold in this adapter representation. That's what you do here. And uh, that's a way of seeing it. There's another I will demo, there's another way of doing the same thing. You mentioned here the square point of size f by f, but in practice f is small, is large, and so uh, practice it depends on the amount of noise. It depends on the standard deviation of your noise. What happens is that I mean, if you have a signal and you add a lot of oscillations, depending on the, ma on the magnitude of the oscillations, in order to have a reliable measure, you will need to take a larger patch. But in fact, you don't want it to be very large because finally you are interested in the, in the actual value of the pixel in the center. So you're not interested in taking a huge, huge patch. In practice, it might be 5.5 uh, five five or 8 by 8 or something. No and, larger than that. and the number of neighbors is proportional to the size of the patch. Uh, and then you look at the number of neighbors to that patch. So the larger the patch, so the more neighbors do you need? Or the Dep what happens is that when you are doing a PCA, you have data. You will have, let's say, n patches of dimension p. You need n to be larger than p if you want to have a good PCA. The difference between the PCA and the wavelet and the DCT is that with the wavelets and the DCT, you fix the basis before starting coding. Yeah. When you use a PCA, it adapts to your data. So somehow it also adapts to your noise. Yeah, but you have a lot of flexibility in choosing the size of, the, of that and also choosing how many neighbors you choose. You, you basically need that the number of neighbors, the K here, is larger than this P in order to do your, in order to do your PCA. Because if not, your PCA will adapt too much to your noise instead of your signal. So it's, it's a question of, of PCA. Uh, there's another way of seeing this, and maybe it's easier, I find it a bit more complicated, but you never know, that is talking about a Bayesian modeling. We do exactly the same. Uh, for each patch, look for your neighbors, and then you say, instead of computing the PCA, you say, I'm going to suppose uh, a Gaussian model for my, for my patches. So I suppose that basically this, but in fact, the patches follow a certain Gaussian model, 
with a certain covariance matrix in here. So you suppose that your patches live in a Gaussian model. If you do that, you can compute using the Bayes formula, you can compute the maximum posteriori. <coughs> that, I mean, this tilde p is the noisy patch, so this is noisy, and you want to estimate the patch without noise that maximizes this probability. So the one that has more probability to explain what happened here. So if you do that, uh, you suppose that this follows a model. This is just the model given by the noise. They suppose that the noise is Gaussian. So this is noise. It's, it means simply that we add noise. So if we add noise, which is the likelihood of, our, uh, of a certain noise, will be the difference of the two patches. This is a sum of squares. So it's the sum of exponentials. It's just uh, how probable is my noise realization in a Gaussian. So that's no problem. Just we do the supposition here. And uh, we try to maximize this probability. So the probability, as always, when you have your exponentials, you, you do your logarithm. So it, it turns the maximum to minimum, and the exponential disappear. And then you have to maximize this. You have to minimize this. And you need to find <coughs> the covariance matrix or the model of the true image that you, I mean, of the true pattern that you do not have. And what you do is to, as in fact the model is additive and Gaussian, you know that the covariance matrix of the model of the noisy patches will be the covariance of the original model plus the noise. And you can do these computations. So you approximate the, the, the average of the true patches by the average of the noisy patches, because the, the noise is zero mean. And uh, you approximate the covariance matrix of the true patches using this expression. So it becomes the minus sigma squared here. You minimize it, and you got a closed formula. So it's not exactly the same algorithm that I showed before, but it's nearly given. The results are the same. Because finally, here you have the covariance matrix. And in fact, the PCA, what it does is to compute the alien vectors of this covariance matrix. Because even if it's not exactly the same formula, it does nearly the same. I find much easier to understand if you know what the PCA is. Much easier to understand is that I'm putting all these exponentials here and, and the maximum posterior stuff. It's more fancy than that. So, I am going to show some results. I don't what time is it? No. Ah, okay. Okay, so I will be done. This is a, a noisy image where the additive Gaussian noise was zero equal 30. That's what you got with the, uh, with the integral with the NL means of the patches. And this is what you got when you put, uh, in fact, this is NLPCA. I think this is done with the PCA. It is not with the Bayesian, but the results are the same. It is done with the PCA. So you see the difference, it's much better. And there's another one. This is Plaza España, and this is by the most suggestive information. <laughs> That's what you get with NL means. And that's when you get with the NLPCA or NLPC. So these are not real examples. I mean, I have the original image, and I, I added that Gaussian additive y noise, etc. If you go to to real data, for example, for these images, I have the raw image because I used the reference camera, and this is the image I ob I obtain when I apply the imaging chain. I mean, I have the reflex. I also have an imaging chain. I apply myself with the mosaicing algorithm, the gamma correction, etc., etc., etc. So I'm able to take the raw, and I do not need to go to Lightroom or Perture or Photoshop, whatever. I have my own chain. And what I obtain is this. If we look close, this is what we got. So this is the 
the image we reconstruct without applying any denoising. This is what we got. If we apply the denoising of the sensor of the CFA, so not of the image of, uh, of the red, green, blue, etc., etc., and then after I denoise the values, I apply the machine chain. I got this. So it's a bit better, but it makes a difference. And this is what you have if you denoise directly this one. If instead of denoising the sensor, you denoise the final output of the camera with this image, you got this. So this is the difference of having access or not to the reference, I mean to the raw data. So it's always to be as close as possible to the data. And always is the noise is whiter and less structured as close as you are to the, to the position and not to the to last step. So that's okay, I think that's that's all I have time to explain. So. In data analysis, I think that more than PCA, people are using independent performance analysis. I mean, which I think is not exactly the same. It's totally different, yes. Yeah. Would you try to apply it in your cases or in one with your own? No, it's totally different in the sense that with PCA, you have a basis of your data, it's just a change of variable. In ICA, it's completely different. Let's say you will find the basis. It's not true, but let's say you will find the basis of the derivative for the Laplace from your image. It's completely different. You have functions that are really oscillatory, mm -hmm. uh, which are have a very small support. I mean, I say, I mean, if you take if you take thousands of small patches, a by eight of the image, you take I don't know 100 images, and you take the a by eight patches, and you do the PCA you will find the Fourier basis. If the ICA is done to explain that, you will find the, what the neurons do somehow. You find the directional derivatives, etc., etc. So it's completely different. No questions. Okay. Another examples, you show something, and then everybody agrees that okay, this image is better than the other. Yeah. Why? I mean, this, uh, I mean, it depends. Uh, in this case, for example, it's better because I have the original image, so I computed the distance to the original image to the true image, and I know the error is smaller. So in this case, it is. In this one, you cannot compute uh, an error or a distance to a true value. You will find many measures, in the, I mean, in the literature you will find many measures saying that this is better than that or whatever, but finally, when you do not have a ground proof, it's a matter of visual, it's, it's more visual pleasant this one than this one. Finally, for example, here, all these lines are erased, and uh, in here all these lines are kept, and here you have the more tester which is more natural, and here you have something which is gray, which was originally gray, and if you look at the videos here, you have some steel spots, colored spots, etc., etc. But it's a matter of, of visual. Uh, for example, in the, ca in the case of the MRI, if the doctor is going to say he loves more the photo, this one or this other one, or before or after the noise. Those are subjective criteria. Yeah. Why, why this is important, I think, for example, when, when we do experiments in the lab, we also get noisy data. We have, for mm -hmm. example, detection noise, which might also be edited. Uh, and there might be also the desire to denoise those experimental data. Mm -hmm. So why, how can we get criteria which are not subjective, like in the image processing, but where we can say what would be the best denoising procedure uh, that we could get, for example, for like, experimental data? Mm -hmm. Is, is that here it depends on here it depends on the data and it depends on the expert. For example, for the graphics I presented in at the at the beginning. 
For example, here you have the ground truth. You just have to wait two weeks to have the ground truth. So you can always make a distance. And here is going to be the here is going to be the doctor. He is the photographer. For example, I have this photo. I mean, this uh, no, the, the third one. This is the uh, a row of a mobile phone. You cannot extract the raw from a mobile phone. You can do it from a reference camera. If I use this image, it's because I work with a company that makes a software uh, which does all the treatment from here to the, to the core image. So they hire professional photographers to say if they look, if they like more the photograph or not. They do not have measures. They hire photographers, professional photographers, which go one day stay and, and say, I like this one more, or I prefer that one, etc. In satellite imaging, for example, I don't have any, any example of satellite imaging. When you do it in satellite imaging, are the experts that goes and, and say and look at this, yes, uh, here I see the, I don't know, the, the guns better, or I see the, the, the terrorists better, or whatever. It's, it's like, like that. There are, there are analysts, there are military analysts, and look at the image and decide if you're arguing. But it's still, but it's still subjective. Take, take, for example, the MRI images. Yeah. Uh, and you say, for example, one criterion is whether the doctor likes it more or not. But another criterion would be if you want to quantitatively analyze this data for, for diagnosis. Yeah. Then it would not be a subjective criteria which you think looks better, but what would give you more But, but still, right? or they simulate data, or they have somehow, uh, they have data which is noisy, but there's been someone who has already defined what better is. There's always someone expert behind that decides or has somehow given you how to decide that. I mean, there are indexes, there are structural indexes, there are many measures that exist in the literature to analyze images, or to analyze images but they do not work. I mean, finally, if you run through, you make the distance of not there's someone who decides uh, what's better. I mean, there are many measures, but I'll try to I think I missed something at the beginning because you said, I, if, I, if I'm not wrong, you said that every if you have a pixel which is next to the next to the previous one, they belong to the same object. Yeah. You said something like that. But I mean, how do you think with the front? How do you think with the? No, no. What, what I've said is that if, if you want to choose the pixel to average, you you need to make some assumptions. And one assumption is to say that it's more likely that the pixel has a true value. Similar if they were one next to the other. It's not that I'm supposing. It's that just you need to somehow restrain where you are going to look for the pixels. So you support that if they are closer, it's more likely that they will yeah, be known to see borders. Huh? Because in borders, the pixels might be very different. Why, if you ask because for the probability to be in the same option? Because, no, because you have, you, have, you have another constraint. You have, you have this one. Which is that you are comparing also the color. If the color of two neighboring pictures were different, this is going to be this difference is going to be large and going to be the way to zero. I mean, if you only assume that those pixels are likely to belong to the same object, this is a Gaussian convolution. There's no, there's nothing no linear here. It's a Gaussian convolution, and you are going to blur your signal. So it's this term that avoids this blurring. Yeah. I have a question on the, on the dependence of the results on the parameters that you choose. So first, what you do again to uh, uh, the composition in uh, principal value, mm -hmm. uh, you selected a size, an area, a K, a P, P, F, whatever. You show a result, mm -hmm. but what happens if and this result has been obtained with a given value of those parameters? What happens if you just take F to X I mean, to small? Uh, uh, K to watch to small. What, what are the what, what are the say the, okay. the, the safe boundaries of all those things? So, so how should it be? Yeah. For example, uh, they are related. For example, if you take here a very small value, let's say three by three instead of eight by eight, this value is going to be smaller because you need less patches to learn the PCA of. This guy's living in a not so high uh, dimensional space. And then you have to choose a larger value here because uh, 
and your patch is quite small, your PCA will, de will, will depend a bit more on the noise. So we have larger waves and you will have to put a larger one in here. So everything is related. Now if you select randomly for meters. Uh, OK, but well then, then, for instance, the, the, the image that you, you showed yeah. here, what, was, uh, what were the parameters that were? Here it was 5 by 5 or 7 by 7. I don't remember. So it's, it's about this size. Yeah, five, five, six, seven, seven, seven. And then, it, it, and that, do that with needs, for instance, the size of the leaf of the trees that you are going to see, or the size of the tiny no, that, of, that, the, of the bar. This is limited by the amplitude of the noise. Yeah, yeah. But, but once you choose that, then the, the the details that you are going to see are probably related to that part of the of the size. Of course, because. So I guess that there is a, a balance. Yeah, there. I mean, if, if, the, if, the, if the noise value, let's say sigma is 10, you can use a 3 by 3 or 5 by 5 is a way to change. Now, if you have a noise of 80, you need a huge patch. But in fact, if you have a noise standard elevation of 8, you're not going to see anything, and you're not going to recover the leaves yeah. anyway. So, so, but, but, but the, the, so and the, 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 the ultimate resolution you can see against of the size of the patch that you should. The patch and the amplitude of the noise. OK. You're not going to recover the leaves. Even if you use a patch 3 by 3, if you put a noise of standard elevation of 50. You cannot, because that will not work. Yeah, it will not work. Okay. I mean, you can do it with video, can, which can was you? the other talk. I mean, the, the I didn't have time to show you. Can we do it video, but I don't want to. Can you do it iteratively? Yeah, well, I mean, I showed uh, some ideas and the basis of the algorithm, etc. In fact, this is done with two iterations, not with one in practice. <laughs> what you do is that you use the first iteration as an oracle, as a ground truth information to drive the second iteration. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, you use the first iteration to select the patches. And also, you use the first iteration in order to drive this threshold here. And usually apply two iterations. It's not when you go to the third one, you don't change anything. Another question. Everything is about patches which are of the same size. But mm -hmm. if you think on an image that has very bizarre uh, uh, dependent on different parts, yeah. probably ideally would want, would want to have patches of different size depending on the part of the image that one wants to And different shape. So yeah, you like different size and different shape. So but you, you, you don't know how to I mean what happens is that when you have a lot of noise you cannot decide. No. Which I mean, which one is better? Because the image is not that one. I mean let's assume that you have an image that's yeah. not that bad one to increase the resolution. So is is an adapt so like a, doing an adaptive mesh, like for instance what is done in I mean uh, computation. It's clear that if you choose the correct shape and size is going to work better, but you don't know how to choose the correct so size. No, there is no. no. I mean, it's clear that what happens is that uh, it, it's just a matter of when you look to the correct neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you have here a cont if you have a contrast between black and, 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 and white, for example, and you take a small patch. Uh, when you move it, I mean, the correct ones are in here. Mm -hmm. You can see that when you move it here, for example, and you're one to the right of the correct ones, the distance you are going to pay, OK. I mean, you have, so, you have something like that. And you have this patch. The correct ones are in here. If, you are, if you're here, you are going to pay somehow only one color. Mm -hmm. However, if you have. Something like that, when you're in here, you're going to pay much more. So you're going to find the correct patches for this structure if you use this rather than that. But what happens is that in practice, uh, what happens is that if the standard deviation is of 10, 15, you are able to have very good results. When you have 30 or 40, it's, you have results which are not so good, but you cannot try to yeah, yeah, base this anyway. Of course, it will work better if you, ha if you have the true image, and from the true image, without noise, you decide which is the correct structure when you don't have the true image. Yeah. And, when you, and when you do something iterative, many times while you lose in the first situation, you don't recover in the mm -hmm. second or first. So that's what we do. Final question. Okay. That is
So let's thank Tony.